Okay, so you all heard that, right? Yes. Or not? You heard recording yes, in progress? We got it. Yes. Okay, good. So Thank if you, you. <laughs> so if you speak or if you make yourself visible, it's on you. Uh, but good. At least I won't be the only one. Um, okay, so the notion here is to in, to put randomness into our simulations. And we already know a lot about this just from the homework you've been doing. Um, why do we want randomness in our simulations? Um, for Because there's complexity in the world. Um, things aren't constants in the real world. And so they shouldn't be constants in our simulation. Uh, if we know, that's a different question, but if we know the distribution that our data, our input data follows, that's great. Then we can sample from it, from this distribution. Uh, not for this, this class, but uh, maybe next week or the week after, we'll be looking at how do we know what the distribution is? How do we know that our, for example, that our inter-arrival times are exponential? Okay, it's a different question. Right now, all we know is we need randomness. Um, you saw that when you, uh, for those of you, well, even when you did the uniform distribution, and for those of you who did your the Excel using the exponential distribution, it was all based on a random the random number generator, RAND, which gave you a random number between zero and one, if I'm not mistaken. So that's the first thing, and that's what this lecture really is all about. It's about the base randomness, not about generating uh, vari variates from a particular distribution. Um, we could, although we don't, we could use real randomness in our simulation, right? If you, if you haven't thought about it, you could think about it now. Um, we could use, we, and is in fact, the, the checkout stand started out that way where we were using something that was really random, uh, tossing a die, um, chips in a hat, labeled one to 10. And you can see there are other, other ideas, a roulette wheel. Um, it, generally speaking, when you have a truly random number, there are some real physical uh, process that generates the randomness. Um, radioactive decay. Um, bumping electrons off of a wall or towards a wall and so it bounces off and uh, measuring the distance from the center or from, a, from an edge. Um, something that results in randomness and that can be measured. Um, that sounds extremely uh, messy and extremely expensive. So you can understand we don't do that. Um, however, we might do that to generate random numbers, right? Uh, we've all, I, if you haven't, you can look, look it up when uh, you, get, you get home or well, you are home probably. When you get to a book in either probability or statistics, at the back of the book, there'll be a random numbers table. You probably used it before in your undergraduate studies. Um, what, what were these, uh, where did these random numbers come from? Well, we know where they came from. They came from the RAND Corporation, which actually used an electronic simulation of a roulette wheel um, for the randomness, true, true randomness, attached to a computer to generate the measurements, the values. And th that wasn't good enough, even though it was truly random. Um, so they had to also test it. And perhaps there was some filtering going on to make sure that um, extreme values, let's say, uh, you know, weren't left in. There was certain parameters that they needed to uh, match. Um, your book of, of random numbers comes from, um, or the table of random numbers at the back of your book comes from a book that was put out in 1955 by Rand with those random numbers. And in addition, um, between in the, you know, the late 1940s and on, uh, the RAND Corporation made these random numbers available to people on a magnetic tape um, so that 
you know, you, you don't have to actually key in the values from the random number table. And what you see there on the screen is just a clip, a piece of the random number table. Um, and it's, in, it's grouped in, in units of five digits. And it looks two-dimensional, but it's not two-dimensional. It's just a, one long stream of random digits. Um, so if you look at the, the top left, it starts with seven, seven, three, seven, three, five, four, five, nine, six, three, and so on across the, across the row and then in major row order. Um, and all that was was a convenient way of arranging one long stream of random digits. Uh, so those, they don't have anything to do with each other. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter that they're in groups of five or that there's, it looks like it's in two dimensions. None of, that is, uh, none of that is important. It's just a stream of random digits. So we could use true randomness. These digits are truly random. We could still get access to it on an electronic, an electronic form. We could probably get a, a file with it. Um, think about why we don't. You know, I'm not asking people to contribute because we're recording and I know people um, may not wish to, but please uh, do feel free if you don't mind to just unmute yourself anytime and jump in, uh, and either answer questions or ask your own. Um, so think about it. If we have a file of random numbers or in this case, random digits, how do we access it for our simulation program? Um, we would have to read a digit from the file. Maybe we'd have to read a sequence of 10 digits from the file, if that's what we need. Use it in the simulation, discard it, and then go to the next one and read another number and use it in the simulation. And you may not realize this, uh, but um, reading from an external file is extremely expensive. It, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of computer time. It's the, the, probably the most expensive thing that you could be doing in the, the context of, uh, if you're paying for computer time, for example. Uh, it's a very inefficient use of your time. Uh, so it, we could do it, but now let's move on to look at something that might be almost as good and sometimes maybe even better. All right, what we actually use are, are not random numbers, even though the function in, in Excel is called rand. Um, they're really pseudo random numbers. And if you look at the diagram on the slide, that's exactly what a pseudo random number generator does. It outputs a random number and then uses that random number as input in order to generate the next number and the next number and the next number. So there's a stream of random numbers, each one generating the next. And naturally, it's booted up externally before you get into that loop by a single random number that's used once. And that's called the seed, S-E-E-D. That should probably be, I, I, I should probably put that in the slide, shouldn't I? Uh, so that random number that's used once as input to the pseudo random number generator is the seed which then produces the entire stream of random numbers that comes after it. It's nice to know because if we ever want to duplicate what we've done before, all we have to do is use the same seed and it will produce the same stream of random numbers every single time. And if we don't want to duplicate what we did before, but we, wa we want true randomness, we just start with a different seed, which has its own issues, of course, as we know. Um, so not only are truly random numbers inefficient and more expensive to use, especially when we're talking about computer time, even uh, many simulation programs are, you know, take a very long time. Uh, some of them even have to be run on a supercomputer. Um, however, they're still doable. Um, in addition to that reason, uh, pseudo random numbers are better uh, because 
well, it's faster, which not only means that I don't have to pay for that lengthy computer time, but it's faster. I don't have to wait such a long time for my program to run. In the programs we've been doing, that's not an issue. Um, but, but in other cases, it is. Um, but even more, probably the best reason for using pseudorandom numbers uh, is because I can actually not replicate, I can duplicate what I've done before. If I have the same model and the same random numbers, I will get exactly the same thing that I got before. So you're going to say, why would I want that? Why would I want to get the same thing I got before? Um, there are cases when you would want that. Suppose I'm uh, planning um, to renovate my hospital emergency room. Wouldn't it be nice if I could take the customers I had yesterday, do the renovation, and then run the same customers with the same illnesses through the emergency room tomorrow after the renovation and look at the differences? Well, I could do that by, by this, this feature of reproducibility. Uh, if I use a pseudo random number generator as opposed to truly random numbers. Um, certainly, if I use a, a pseudo random number generator as opposed to um, just uh, experimenting in the real world. Okay. Truthfully, with truly random numbers, as long as I have saved them in some format, I can reuse them. Sure. Um, a disadvantage of pseudo random numbers and especially a disadvantage if we want to keep on using a different seed uh, in order to have um, to not have the same um, uh, the, the same uh, entities moving through the system at the same rate and at the same time each time. Um, every pseudo random number generator has what's called periodicity. Um, there is a finite period during which every uh, random number generates another new random number. But after a while, it goes back, it cycles back to the beginning. And uh, you have the very same uh, stream of random numbers from that point. Okay. Obviously, clearly, that's a problem, especially if you don't know what's going on. All right, so everyone wants to see what a pseudo random number generator looks like. Here's one. It's a simple one. And as you can see, it's also an old one. Um, it's presumably not what we're using in our calculators, in programs, in Excel, uh, because there are better, more efficient ones. But the nice thing about this is it's simple to, to do by hand and it's simple to understand. Um, okay, let's see how it works. It's called middle square. Um, we start with, as always, we start with a random number of a certain number of digits. In this case, we're looking for an uh, n of is even. So, you know, whatever it is, uh, whatever you decide on, uh, that you, you figure out what your seed will be, um, some random number, you can even start with a sequence of random digits, an even number of them, from the random number table. Uh, take the random number, do some arithmetic to it. That's what all of these um, random number generators do. Uh, they take the random number, do some arithmetic to it, and output, spit out uh, the next random number in the sequence. In this case, what are we doing? We're squaring it. We're adding zeros to the left, which we know um, is doable and doesn't change the value. And uh, we're going to form a sequence. We add enough digits to form a sequence of two n digits. So if we have, let's go to the example. Um, if we have uh, one 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 as our, that's a wonderful seed, right? If we have one 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 as our as our first random number. We square it. Get one two three four three two one. That's seven. We put the zero on on the left, which doesn't change things, but makes it an eight digit number. And um, the center is two, three, four, three. We take the, the middle four digits to create the new random number of four digits. 
okay? And the more digits you use, obviously, um, the, the better you'll be, especially if you're doing this for cryptography. Uh, this, this is one that's probably not going to be used because uh, the, the periodicity is very small. It starts to repeat very quickly. Why couldn't you preview my file? Let's see if I get it now. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, what should a good pseudorandom number generator have? It's, this is pretty much common sense. <laughs> I think you could figure all of these out on your own. Uh, but let's take a look. Let's go down the list. Um, they should be random. Of course, they're not going to be random. How do we know that pseudorandom numbers are not random? How, how, how do we know they're not random? Well, if I give you a pseudorandom number that goes into the generator, I can predict what the output will be. That's the very definition of relatedness, of, of not being random. If you can predict what your random number will be, clearly it's not random. If you can compute a random number using a bunch of arithmetic, clearly it's not random. So our pseudo-random numbers aren't really random. That's why they're called pseudo-random. They behave like random numbers. All right. I see a chat flashing. Is that okay? Any, any problem with that? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I, I should learn my lesson. Um, if you see something in the chat, somebody check to see if it's important and um, give me Morse code or you could even send me an email. I have my phone right here if you don't want to speak. Okay. Um, all right, so basically pseudo-random numbers appear random. They act random. Um, clearly, they should be reproducible because one of the things we liked is the fact that as long as we have the seed, we can produce the same stream of random numbers each and every time, every single time. That's not only something we like, it's critical because there's no point in, in using pseudo-random numbers otherwise over truly random numbers. It's a huge advantage. We want the algorithm to be fast. We want it to work quickly. We don't want to have to wait to get the random numbers. As you know from working with Excel, once things get a little bit complicated, uh, even a few seconds of a delay when things are recomputing annoys us. Um, we want to, to make efficient use of re computer resources. So it's not only time, it's also space. In other words, how much storage space is used, where the storage is. Uh, whenever we say efficient in relation to computer resources, we're talking about issues of time and space. Uh, we want to make sure that even though we know there will always be cycling, there will be periodicity, we want to make sure that the algorithm we use has a long period. It doesn't cycle too soon because it's pretty much useless if it does. Um, and we want to make sure that not only do we want numbers to be random, but we don't. We want them to be distinct. We don't want to get the same number over and over again. That if that happens, that means the whole thing just degenerated. Um, how can we test random numbers? The fact of the matter is that pseudo-random numbers are tested when, when, uh, when someone, uh, let's say we, um, tests a pseudo-random number generator uh, for goodness uh, to see how good it is. They're gonna be, it's going to be tested to see if the numbers are quote unquote random, which basically means do they act like random numbers? We know they're not random but we want to know if they act like random numbers. Um, these, these pseudo random number generators do test well. They act like random numbers for the most part. There's a little bit of an issue with Excel, uh, at least in the 2010 edition. Um, the interesting thing is that if you do higher level testing, which of course we're not doing in this course, but if you ever 
find yourself in a situation where you are doing higher level testing and by higher level, I mean, um, multi-dimensional hyperplane testing. So in other words, when we test the stream of random digits or a stream of random numbers, um, we're testing something linear, right? But if you take these numbers and look at them in a hyperplane, very often patterns emerge. And um, the people who, the mathematicians who study this have basically said, there's no such thing as a truly random pseudo random number generator. But as always, what we're looking for is good enough. We're looking for it to be good enough, random enough. If it passes the tests of randomness, uh, we're happy, then we're good. Okay. So even though, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, lecture on um, generating random variants. This one does happen to have um, narration, but I'll continue recording. And then at some point when we all get, uh, when we feel we've had enough, I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'll stop and I'll, uh, um, pause the recording or I'll close the recording and then we can move on to other things. Professor, I'm the one that uh, messaged you. I just have to leave like around like five or 10 minutes. Um, I, just I sure. won't even, I won't even notice. Yeah. I just want to let <laughs> you Don't know. you like hearing that? I won't even notice you're gone, but thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. People are so polite. I'm really, I'm, I've been teaching undergraduates and I'm really not used to it, but thank you. Okay. Um, to some degree, we're trying to straighten out terminology. And quite frankly, I don't think that's what we should be doing in the lecture. It's not, not that important. And it's also not going to directly affect what you're doing in the homework. Um, so I will just say in general, when we sample from a distribution, we will often maybe even usually call it Monte Carlo sampling or Monte Carlo methods. So when we were generating the um, inter-arrival times in Excel for 20 or 50 or 100 customers, that was a, a Monte Carlo method. Um, so whenever we're sampling values from a distribution, a particular distribution, getting random variates, uh, that can be called Monte Carlo sampling. Some people will consider it simulation. Um, I think simulation should have a time element. Um, and Monte Carlo simulation is just a numerical analysis. It doesn't have a time element. Um, it's a um, static sampling. Right. All right. The it's interesting to note that um, Monte Carlo methods go back to, well, the technique goes back to the 18th century, uh, but it wasn't called Monte Carlo then. The the name Monte Carlo goes back to the Manhattan Project, um, in which uh, many physicists from different countries got together to create uh, that thing called the atom bomb. And naturally, it was it was a big secret, uh, which was why it was called the Manhattan Project and not the atom bomb project. Um, and anything connected to it was kept secret. And so the the code name Monte Carlo uh, was used for the method of sampling for this methodology. Um, all right, this you can read on your own. I'm not going to read. I, you know, reading slides is boring. And again, it's not relevant to what we're doing right now with our homeworks. But you should, you, you should do it on your own. OK. When do we use Monte Carlo? Um, sometimes th there were other reasons. OK, one thing that I said earlier is that if we want to sample um, variates from a particular distribution. Sometimes we want to compute things that are best computed with uh, numerical methods uh, iteratively, like the value of pi. 
uh, or like repeatedly sampling from a distribution where the mean is, is either too difficult or impossible to compute using expectation. Um, and and we, we get the mean pretty much empirically that way. And it's it, kind of weird to call it empirically, but yeah, it is. Um, okay. So here's how Monte Carlo methods work in general. They're not all the same, obviously. Uh, we have a random number somehow generated by some method, like getting, getting it from a magnetic tape, a table of random numbers, a roulette wheel, a computer program, like a pseudo random number generator. Somehow we need a source. We need a source of random numbers or pseudo random numbers. And we also need the cumulative probability distribution. And I'll show you why on the next slide. See that little picture? If you've never seen a cumulative distribution, you probably should go back and look one up. Um, let me just use my pen. OK. So if uh, just to just to draw a very common distribution, the normal, right? The normal distribution goes to plus infinity on one side, negative infinity on the other side. Here's the mean. The mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode. Uh, the cumulative distribution. Uh, comes from taking our probabilities for as we go along the x-axis and accumulating them. So that by the time we get to the very last place where we could be, it's 100% of the distribution, wherever that is. And we start out with zero of the distribution. Take a look at what happens. We keep increasing and increasing and increasing, which is very much like what you see down here. And then we not only are increasing, but we're jumping in the middle where we have um, the most concentration of the frequencies or the uh, proportion of the data in our distribution. All of a sudden there's a jump and then it peters out again as we go to the other side, the values on the higher side. So this S-shaped curve is very typical of a, a cumulative probability distribution for a symmetric distribution uh, where uh, the mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode. And that's practically the definition, or certainly one of the properties of the normal distribution. OK. so. Why do we want it? Why do Monte Carlo methods depend on having a cumulative probability distribution? Well, look at this. Um, we have a, a, a number between zero and one. Isn't that great? Um, and our random numbers come to us as numbers between zero and one. The, the median at the 50% mark is 0.5. The probability, the cumulative probability is 0.5. Suppose we want to know uh, what that corresponds to in our original data. We can um, horizontally go till we hit the curve at 0.5 and then drop down. And hopefully, if it's a normal distribution or some other very symmetric distribution, we'll be at the mean. But whatever x value that is, it it's corresponds to uh, the 50% mark in, in the uh, cumulative probability distribution. So it's very useful to be able to look at a distribution, not in terms of um, the, the x, not in terms of the um, a relative frequency of all, any particular value or group of values, but in terms of the cumulative frequency or the cumulative probability. 
Um, so how, how, do we, how do we do this? Okay. We get the probability distribution. We get a random number between zero and one. It's, we get it randomly. So randomly, we'll find a number between zero and one. We project horizontally. We drop down vertically. And we sample our x variable. Uh, that's how we, we would do it graphically. Of course, as we probably could figure out, we don't want to do it graphically for so many reasons, uh, the, not the least of which is the fact that it's very hard to get um, a very fine-tuned value of x. You know, we should be able to get something like 3.5 or 3.67, but to get 3.63241 would be difficult. Okay. Um, so this is the, an algorithm instead of a graphical approach. And this is the algorithm that you've, you've used, you found it, uh, you either found it here or you found it on Google or you found it, well, that's probably it. Um, and it's called the inverse transform method. And it's exactly the same as getting a, a number between zero and one, a random number hanging a horizontal, hanging a vertical, and finding that value of x. It's exactly the same as the graphical approach. Um, I just want to make a point. Uh, this is a cumulative distribution that's more for symmetric distributions like the normal. And this is probably closer to an exponential. Anyway. Um, oh, here, yeah, the formula for the cumulative exponential distribution. Okay. So if we want to use the inverse, inverse transform to get to generate random numbers from an exponential distribution, which is the same, by the way, as what we would use for a Poisson, only in the inverse. Um, okay, f of x. That's our function that gives us the cumulative probability distribution. The cumulative probability distribution for an exponential is one minus e to the negative lambda x, where lambda is the parameter. Um, if we add one to both sides, we haven't really changed anything, have we? because uh, one, f of x and one minus f of x are both numbers between zero and one. So that worked. Um, now all we do is replace one minus f of x with, we're getting a random number from a pseudo random number generator and we wanna generate a random number that's between zero and one. That's what that RN means. And what we're left with on the right side is e to the minus lambda x. Remember all of this is, going towards solving for x. Well, if we take the natural log of both sides, the natural log of the random number on the one side, the natural log of e to the et cetera, the, the natural log on the e cancel, and we end up with negative lambda times x on the right. Um, but we want x. So we take negative lambda and divide the right side and the left side by negative lambda. And we end up, lo and behold, with what, you've, what you saw um, our two presenters using in Excel, um, negative one over lambda times the log of the random number between zero and one. Um, and just you know writing it more neatly here, but it doesn't really matter how you write it. Okay. All right, this is what we were talking about earlier. I, I said this in response to a question during one of the presentations. Um, and this, so it's just a repeat. Um, the Poisson and the exponential are inverse of each other. If you wanna prove it to yourself, just make sure you keep track of the units, okay? The exponential distribution is uh, in, times, in terms of time. And you generally are talking about time per entity, uh, like inter-arrival time between successive entities, service time per entity. 
And the Poisson is actually, the Poisson is an interesting distribution. It's considered a discrete distribution, but it's, this, it's a discrete distribution. It's a distribution of a discrete random variable that's inside of a continuous interval, which is the only one that I can think of that's like that. It's very unusual. So the Poisson uh, distribution would govern, let's say, number of defects in a square yard of material. Um, and in this case, uh, what we're looking at are rates, um, number of customers uh, per time interval, that's a rate. And that could be the rate of service or the rate of arrival, uh, number of entities per time unit. If you turn it around, time unit per number of entities, then you have an exponential. Okay. Again, I'm assuming that if you have questions or if you want me to go through something a little slower, uh, you will let me know somehow. I'm gonna do a couple of more uh, slides. Um, we already did the, the part that was relevant to the homework. I just wanna show you that there are other distributions and there's other things we could be doing, but the process is usually the same. Not always, but usually. Suppose we have a a different discrete probability distribution. We looked at the Poisson. I mean, you could do it with, I suppose, with binomial too, we haven't. Here's a general probability distribution where it's just enumerated. There's no formula, okay? And we've seen problems like this and you've seen problems like this in other classes, I'm sure. In this case, uh, this is the distribution of customers that are arriving in uh, 10 minute intervals, the number of customers to arrive, the probability of the of particular values of customers arriving in, in a particular time interval, 10 minute interval. So in any 10 minute interval, interval, we can expect zero customers arriving with probability 40. We can expect one customer to arrive with probability 25, two customers would arrive with probability 20, and three customers with probability 15. The cumulative probability, you just accumulate, okay? The probability of zero customers arriving is 0.4. The probability of zero or one is 0.4 plus 0.25 or 0.65. The probability of zero or one or two is 0.85. And the probability of zero, one, two, three, well, that's gotta be 100% because there's nothing else left. And if we graphed the cumulative probability distribution, it would look like this graph. Thankfully, I learned to do this in Excel by, by this point, so it's a little bit less ugly than the others. Um, and so here's a simulation, suppose, our first five random numbers came out, this number between zero and one, remember, 0 0.09, 0 0.54, 0 0.42, 0 0.80, 0 0.20, okay? Well, for the 0 0.09, there's nothing before um, 0.4, uh, anything in a, any random number between zero and 0.4 is going to be zero on the x-axis, right? Um, so you can take each each one of these random numbers, find where it is on the y-axis, and then go horizontally until you uh, reach the the uh, value you're looking for, and then hang a vertical down and you get the value. So doing this using the graphical approach, of course, you don't have to use the graphical approach. We could use an algorithm too. Um, for these five random numbers, you get zero, one, one, two, zero customers in 50 minutes. And there are other ways of doing it, um, obviously, but this is a simple way and it's using the same principle as we used with the exponential. Now here's something a little different. What if we want to sample from a normal distribution? 
we know what, and here you see, this is the same one as before, the famous S curve. We know what the cumulative distribution looks like for the normal. Um, and we know what the formula is. And we really don't want to solve for X. It's, it's, a, it's the kind of thing that would give us nightmares probably. It could be done or maybe not, I don't know. I have, it's been a long time since I had calculus. Um, at any rate, there are approximations, which, which I'm not gonna go into now. That's, again, it's not relevant, but you should look, look at it. There are approximations that are based on sums. You know that the central limit theorem is based on the notion of averages, which is basically the same as sums. Uh, that says that no matter what the underlying distribution is, if you keep um, repeatedly sampling from it, um, it's going to end up at some point looking a lot like a normal distribution. And this is an example of a uniform distribution, uh, the distribution of a die that after several tosses ends up looking like a triangular distribution. Um, and if you keep on going, you'll end up with something very much like a normal distribution. Okay, so that's just the theory behind it. You know, perhaps we'll come back to this one day in the class, perhaps not. Uh, but there is a method by which to use this for, it's kind of cool, okay, but we're, we're probably not going to need it. Uh, if we do, make sure you let me know. If you need it for some something that you're doing, make sure to let me know and then I'll go back. We'll, we'll go over it in class. Or maybe I'll use a marker board. Okay. Um, oh, this is still, oh, this, it ends up being, you know, uh, this is just simplifying the algorithm. It ends up being not too bad uh, if you don't have to worry about why you're doing it. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording now just in case people want to contribute. If I could figure out where it is.